Hey everyone, I'm Cha, and in this video, I'm going to be giving a brief introduction to decision trees. So we might ask ourselves, what are decision trees? And put very simply, a decision tree is something we can use to make predictions via a series of yes or no questions. So let's look at a concrete example. So let's say we want to predict whether I'm going to drink tea or coffee. And to make that prediction, we can use a decision tree like the one shown here. And so the way this works is we start at the top of the decision tree here, and we just answer the following yes or no questions. So first we ask, is it after 4 p.m.? And if yes, we follow this arrow here. And if no, we follow this arrow here. So let's say yes, it is after 4 p.m. Then our answer is I will drink tea. But if the answer was no, we would follow this arrow and end up at another yes or no question. So this one asks if I got more than six hours of sleep last night. If the answer is yes, we go with tea once again. But if the answer is no, we're going to go with coffee. So this is a very simple and straightforward way we can make predictions using just two pieces of information namely the time of day and the amount of sleep I got last night. And so just to talk a little terminology, because it will come up later, these rectangles that we're seeing throughout the decision tree are called nodes, and we have different types of nodes. So for example, the node that sits at the top of the decision tree is called the root node. Over here in green, we have what is called a leaf node. And these are nodes that don't ask any yes or no questions and where we can assign our prediction. And then we have splitting nodes which ask yes or no questions but are not the root node. And so another way to think about decision trees is graphically. And I personally find this a much more intuitive way to think about things. So here on the right we have the example from before where we have two pieces of information, namely time of day, which we're plotting on this x-axis, and the amount of sleep I got last night, which we're plotting on the y-axis. So another way we can represent what the decision tree is doing is by partitioning this predictor space, meaning the space defined by our two predictor variables, time of day and hours of sleep, partitioning this predictor space into different sections and assigning a label to each section. So what this will look like for splitting on 4 p.m. and six hours of sleep is something like this. So here's 4 p.m. We draw a line here and then here's six hours of sleep. We draw another line here. And now we just look at the leaf nodes for each of these splits and assign a label to each section. So intuitively, this is all a decision tree is doing. It's taking the predictor space, splitting it into different sections, and then assigning a label to each section. So now that we have a basic understanding understanding of what decision trees are and an intuition for how they work, a natural question is how can we bring this into practice? Namely, how can I use a decision tree in the real world? And so this is a great question and as it turns out, we can use decision trees in practice by developing them from data. So put another way, we can learn decision tree structure from data. So I'm going to walk through an example here just to give you a qualitative sense of how this works. And I'll just kind of start with a disclaimer that there are many ways to grow decision trees from data. But what I'm going to describe here is a widely used methodology. All right, so before getting into it, I need to introduce the concept of Gini impurity. And so I'm just throwing the equation up here for completeness and for those that think in terms of math and just describing what this is, it's saying that the Gini impurity of a sample s, like this sample right here, is equal to 1 minus the sum over pi squared. And so pi corresponds to the probability of the ith class. Looking at this example here, we have two possible classes, tea or coffee. So the Gini impurity of this sample here would simply be 1 minus the probability of t squared minus the probability of coffee squared. And if that doesn't make any sense, no worries. We can think Think of the Gini impurity in terms of its extremes, namely its minimum and maximum value. So visualizing this, we have minimum impurity whenever every class in our sample is identical. So either every class in the sample is tea or every class in the sample is coffee. On the other end of the spectrum, we have maximum impurity when each class is equally likely. And so for those of you familiar with information theory or the concept of entropy, you'll notice that this quantity Gini impurity is actually proportional with information entropy. Okay, so you might be saying, Sha, why are you talking about this Gini
gene impurity? What does this have to do with decision trees? And I'm glad you asked that because we can use the gene impurity to learn decision tree structure from data. And so the goal when growing decision trees is to use our predictor variables to split our data such that the overall gene impurity is minimized. So essentially growing a decision tree is an optimization problem. And in the following slides, I'm going to walk through a popular way of doing this. So just putting aside our minimum and maximum impurity, just as a reference, and then consider this data set on the right, where each of the rows or records of this data set are represented in this sample over here. So each icon in this box corresponds to a different record in this table. So let's say like this icon corresponds to the first row with this T, this coffee icon corresponds to the second row, and so on and so forth. So again, our goal is to use our predictor variables, time and amount of sleep, to split our data such that we minimize the overall genie impurity. A sort of brute force way of doing this is evaluating every possible split option that we have in our data set. For example, consider time. We can just go through one record at a time and split based on each value we observe in this table. So for example, we take this first value of 721 a.m. and we can split our data based on time being less than or equal to 721 a.m. And the resulting split would look like this. So here we have a sample with just one record, this first one here, and then we have everything else in this other sample here. And then we can evaluate this split option by computing its genie impurity. So basically what I mean by that is we calculate the genie impurity of this sample and the genie impurity of this sample, and then we take their weighted average. So here we just have one class, so that is actually minimum impurity of zero. And then this one is a bit of a mix, so it's gonna be pretty close to maximum impurity. And then we will weight the average by the number of records in each sample. So this one will have a very low weight because it only consists of one record. And then this one will have a very high weight because there are a lot of records in this box over here. So this split will give us a number corresponding to its genie impurity. And then we can just continue this process. And so now we split on 8.47 a.m., calculate the average genie impurity. We split on 9.30 a.m., calculate average genie impurity, and so on and so forth for every possible value of time in this data set. And then we do the same thing for amount of sleep. We look at our first option, which is 5.5. .5. We get something like this, 5.9, 5.95, and so on and so forth for every single value we observe in our data set. And so let's say after doing this and calculating all these average genie impurity values, we discover that the split option of sleep less than or equal to 6.75 hours is the optimal value. This gives us the smallest genie impurity of all the different split options that we observe in our data set. And so now notice this node over here is pure. It has minimum impurity. So it doesn't really make sense to split this sample further. But on the left-hand side, we still have some impurity in this node and we can do additional splits. So let's do that here. So now we have a smaller data set. So instead of starting with all the data in our table, we just have a subset shown by this smaller table over here. And then we just repeat the same exact process as before. We evaluate every split option. Let's say that after evaluating all the split options, we discover that splitting on time less than or equal to 1.45 p.m. gives us the smallest genie impurity. And now notice, again, we have a pure node here, but we still have some impurity here. So we can just keep splitting the data until every single node is pure. So meaning every single node just has a single class in it and it has genie impurity equal to zero. So at first, while this might sound great, you might think, oh, we can have a perfect classifier. We can have a decision tree that is absolutely perfect. However, this is not such a great idea because this brings up a very well-known problem in machine learning known as the overfitting problem. And overfitting is when you learn a machine learning model based on some data set, but your model becomes over-optimized on the data set it was trained on. And when you try to apply that model to new data that it's never seen before, you'll find that your model is actually very inaccurate. And so instead of allowing our decision tree to grow without end and become 
hyper-optimized to our data set, we can control the growth of our decision tree using what are called hyperparameters. Put simply, hyperparameters are values that constrain the growth of our decision tree. And so just to look at a few examples, let's say we have this original decision tree on the left-hand side, but we find that it doesn't generalize well to different data sets, and we actually want to tune it to this simpler decision tree on the right-hand side. So in order to do this, we can actually use hyperparameters. And so here I'm going to show three different hyperparameters we can use to go from this original decision tree on the left to the tuned decision tree on the right. So first we have the maximum number of splits. So in the original decision tree, you see that we have two splits happening, but we could have easily constrained the size of this decision tree by setting the max number of splits equal to one. Another hyperparameter we could have used was the minimum leaf size. So in the original decision tree, we have a minimum leaf size of two, but if we would have set the minimum leaf size to something like five, this additional split could have never happened. And then finally, we could have controlled the number of splitting variables. So in the decision tree from the previous slide, we split on both hours of sleep and time of day. But if we set the number of splitting variables to one, that could have constrained our decision tree to this size. And so the key point is hyperparameter tuning can help avoid this overfitting problem and improve your decision tree's generalizability. So its ability to perform well on new data. And then as a final note, although this is a very widely used way to develop decision trees, this is not the only way to develop decision trees. And I talk a little bit more about alternative strategies for developing decision trees in the blog associated with this video. So if you're interested in that, be sure to check that out. Okay, so with the theoretical foundation set, let's dive into a concrete example with code and data from the real world. So here we're going to do sepsis survival prediction using decision trees. And so here we're going to use the scikit-learn Python library, which is a very popular machine learning library in Python. And then we're going to use a data set from the UCI machine learning repository. All this code that I'm going to walk through here is available in the GitHub repository, which I will also link in the description below. So first step is we're going to import some helpful Python libraries. So pandas is going to help us with formatting our data. NumPy is helpful for doing some math and calculations. We use matplotlib to make visualizations. We import several things from sklearn. And then finally, we're going to import this smote function to help balance our data set, which we will talk about here soon. Okay, so with our libraries imported, we can read in our data set. So with pandas, this is just one line of code. And the CSV file used here is available at the GitHub repo, as well as two additional CSV files that can be used for validating our decision tree. Okay, Okay, so with our data read in, we can plot the histograms for every variable in our data set. So here we just have four variables, the age of the patient, whether the patient is male or female, the number of sepsis episodes that the patient has experienced, and then finally the outcome variable, which is an indicator of whether the patient survived or died. And so the first thing that we should notice here is that we have a imbalanced data set. So what that means is we have a lot more patients that survive than that died. While this is a good thing from a human perspective, this is not a good thing from a model development perspective because if we train our decision tree on this data directly, basically what will happen is that our decision tree will overestimate the alive class and underestimate the dead class. And so one way we can correct this is using SMOTE, which stands for Synthetic Minority Class Over Sampling Technique. I think I got that right. And it's basically a way to to oversample the minority class to make it more equitable with the majority class and ultimately reduce bias in our decision tree. So this is pretty straightforward. So here we're just grabbing the predictor variable names and the outcome variable name. Here we store the predictor and outcome variables into two pandas data frames, namely X and Y. And then finally, with just one line of code, we can use SMOTE to oversample the minority class. And then we can plot the results using matplotlib and 
Look at that, we have a more balanced data set. All right, so now that we have balanced our data set, we can create our training and testing data sets. And so basically the point of this is our training data set will be used to grow our decision tree, and then the testing data set will be used to evaluate its performance. And so here we use an 80-20 split, so 80% of the data is used for training, 20% is used for testing. And then with that, growing the decision tree is very straightforward, we can do it with just two lines of code as we do here. So the first step is we initialize the decision tree classifier. And then the second step is we fit our decision tree to our data. And then that's it. So we have our decision tree. We can take a look at it using this built-in functionality in scikit-learn. And this is what it looks like. Needless to say, this is a very big decision tree. And it's hard to think that a doctor or any medical staff will be able to interpret this decision tree to extract anything meaningful. But let's just put that point aside for now and evaluate our decision tree's performance. And so the way we could do this is using a confusion matrix. And so just looking at this one on the left, what this is showing is the number of true negatives, true positives, false positives, and false negatives. So in other words, this is just comparing the decision tree's predictions to the ground truth. And so I don't wanna get into too many details of interpreting confusion matrices and whatnot. For this discussion, I'll say, when it comes to confusion matrices, you generally want want to maximize the diagonal elements and minimize the off diagonal element. What that means is we want our predictions and the ground truth to agree as much as possible and we want them to disagree as little as possible. So we see for both the training and testing data sets, the performance seems reasonably well. And then another way to evaluate performance is using three different metrics, namely precision, recall, and the F1 score, which are defined by these equations equations on the left here. So precision is basically the number of true positives scaled by the sum of the true positives and false positives. Recall is a similar kind of thing, but it is scaled by the number of true positives and false negatives. And then the F1 score is the harmonic mean of the two. And so in this case, I'd say the precision is something we care more about than recall, because in this context, we probably care more about false positives than false negatives. And so the reason being is a false positive positive corresponds to the case where the decision tree predicted that the patient would survive and they did not. And so if we're using this decision tree to quantify patient risk, then there's a lot more downside to predicting that a patient would survive that didn't than predicting that a patient would die who doesn't. And so clearly, which one of these metrics you want to look at and care about is highly context dependent. Sometimes you care equally about false positives and false negatives. Sometimes you care more about false negatives. Sometimes you might care more about false positives like the case here. And so which metric you use to evaluate your model depends on the problem and the context you're looking at. And then here's a handy function available in the GitHub that generates all this. Okay, so coming back to this massive decision tree from a couple slides ago, this brings up once again, the overfitting problem. So while this decision tree might work reasonably well on the data set here, a decision tree that looks like this is prone to overfitting, meaning it it may not generalize well to new data sets. And so to avoid this problem, we can use hyperparameters. And so here we're just going to use one hyperparameter, which is the maximum depth. And so here we're just going to set that equal to three. So we ensure that the decision tree doesn't get too many branches. Setting this is super easy with sklearn. We just pass this input argument into our decision tree classifier. And then we fit our model just like we did before. And then out comes our tuned decision tree. And so plus plotting out the decision tree, it looks like this. And already we can see this is much more interpretable. We can actually read the text here. And so just kind of looking at all these different splitting nodes, we're seeing the age predictor is appearing a lot. So this is indicating that age seems to be a very important risk factor when it comes to sepsis survival prediction. And then also right here, we're seeing that sex is playing a role, which is a little surprising that we're not seeing number of episodes. And surely if we were to increase the max depth or do some other hyperparameter tuning, we would see that variable appear in 
additional splits. Okay, so our hyperparameter tuned decision tree seems more comprehensible, but how does it perform? And so we can once again look at the confusion matrix and those three performance metrics. And surprisingly, the precision is actually a little better for this hyperparameter tuned decision tree than the fully grown decision tree. But notice that the recall and F1 scores are significantly lower than what we saw before. But I would say in this case, we may not care about that because precision, like I was saying before, might be the metric that we're really trying to optimize in this context because we likely will want to weight false positives more than false negatives. So that was a tremendous amount of information. If you still want to read more, check out the blog published in Towards Data Science on Medium. Be sure to check out the GitHub repo and steal the code and train your own decision tree model with your own hyperparameter optimizations. And if you enjoyed this content, please consider liking, subscribing, and sharing your thoughts in the comment section below. And as always, thank you for your time and thanks for watching.